So welcome everyone to Career Navigation for Scientists, specifically for the departments of Forestry, Chemistry, Geology and Mining and Biology. Thank you all so much for being here. A special thank you to our panelists. Um, and special thank you to Chris Honholt for being here um, for, from Career Services here at MTU. We are partnered with them. Uh, GSG and Career Services work together on some of the professional development seminars. So special shout out to Chris. So first and foremost, I would like to go through the panelists and have each of them do a brief introduction. So first, Dr. Koble, would you please take it away? Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off. Thanks, Margaret. Um, Adam Koble. I currently live in uh, Oregon. Um, and so but I originally grew up in, in Pennsylvania um, and went to college there in this, uh, at Penn State, um, got my bachelor's there in turf grass science in the agronomy program. Um, I think it was about five years after that, I spent um, working seasonal jobs throughout the US, uh, doing a lot of traveling, spent a lot of time in the Four Corners area. Um, and that was kind of when I got an interest in forestry. I, I got a seasonal job with the Forest Service and the BLM. And around that time, I was interested in, in grad school. And um, the closest forestry school there was uh, Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff. Um, there I got my master's in, in uh, forestry. Um, soon after, I uh, moved to the Upper Peninsula. Um, actually lived in Dollar Bay for, was it, four and a half years. Uh, so on the other side of the, the portage there and um, got my PhD in forest science at Michigan Tech. Uh, wonderful experience. Um, I think about the, the UP often. Um, and after that, I, I did a postdoc for two years at the University of New Hampshire and um, was fortunate that me and my wife, we, we both landed postdocs at the same place. And uh, then she got a job in, in Corvallis, Oregon um, after a two year postdoc. And, and I moved out and got a job with the Oregon Department of Forestry. Um, so I've been with this agency for uh, four years now. Um, I started out as a monitoring specialist um, and then recently got promoted to a manager position. And now I manage seven staff and um, that do work in forest health and uh, monitoring and, and research. So um, I've been pretty fortunate in uh, my career and happy where I'm at now. So thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much for that intro. Sure. Next, we have Dr. Carter. Hi. Yeah, I'm Kelsey Carter. I'm a plant physiologist. I'm currently a postdoctoral research at Los Alamos National Lab, which is located in New Mexico. Um, I'm originally from rural Tennessee, which is where I kind of started my higher education at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Um, there I received my Bachelor of Science um, with a major in Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. Um, a few months after graduated, I started an internship at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. I worked um, several different intern positions there for uh, two and a half, around two and a half years. Um, I worked in both environmental sciences. Um, and while I was in that portion, I focused on climate change impacts on plant function. And then um, for about a third of the time, I worked in a genomics lab, um, kind of working more in biosciences. Um, after being there around two and a half years, I moved to Michigan Tech um, and I was there for about four and a half years. I got both my PhD and my master's in the reverse order uh, there, um, master's in applied ecology and PhD in forest science. Um, really enjoyed my uh, time there um, and focused still there on like climate change impacts on plants. Um, for my postdoc, I wanted to kind of change fields a little bit, get some different um, kind of career experience. 
Um, and I started working here at uh, Los Alamos National Lab um, two years ago. And I'm working, still working in earth and environmental sciences, but I'm working more with um, microbiome impacts on plants and, and how microbiomes can help plants deal with uh, stress. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the panel. Very cool. Thank you so much. And Dr. Nikula. Hey, uh, yeah, so I started my career at Michigan Tech, uh, got my bachelor's degree in 2011 in chemistry, and then had the opportunity to kind of stick on and complete my PhD in uh, one of the groups that I had done my undergraduate research in. So I stayed on and during my time at Michigan Tech doing my PhD, I took some time out to do a fellowship at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And while I was working there, I was doing, or uh, trying to apply mass spectrometry to really determine if certain biological specimens have been noticed to have different biomarkers for the exposure to different chemical weapons and different environmental toxins and things like that. So during my time there, I really became interested in mass spectrometry. And so while my PhD was focused on protein expression and inserting different mutations into different proteins and then uh, trying to characterize these different protein structures using atomic force microscopy, I, I then decided I wanted to do kind of really switch gears and go into mass spectrometry imaging, which is something that I learned about during my fellowship. And so I decided my next step was going to be in that area. And so I looked for positions afterwards that were going to teach me a brand new skill set and somehow ended up um, in the UK. So now I work at the National Physical Laboratory in Teddington, England, which is just right outside of London. And it's been a really wonderful experience so far. So the um, NPL is a national measurement institute. So it's kind of uh, synonymous with NIST, but the UK counterpart. So we do a lot of science of measurement is how they put it. Um, but my research focuses mostly on the application of mass spec imaging to map out the distribution of different metabolites and drugs in different tissues, uh, predominantly focusing on cancer research at the minute. Wonderful, thank you. Next, we have Dr. Halami. Hi, um, this is Bhaskar Halami. And uh, my journey started with my career directly after my master's. I was uh, assistant professor before joining the PhD. It seems a little bit odd. Uh, the person who had no PhD was assistant professor. But uh, it was uh, the teaching assistant professor job, uh, which was uh, uh, which was there uh, for me uh, as a undergrad assistant professor, just for teaching purpose. Uh, I was lecturer till uh, from two thousand three to two th uh, thousand six, and then it was upgraded to the assistant professor. And after that, I joined PhD at Michigan Technological University and uh, in chemistry. And I worked with Dr. Fang there. And while working with Dr. Fang, uh, I was introduced to so many different areas of chemistry. One was uh, being a very, very promising area of oligonucleotides. And I worked there for the synthesis of phosphoramidides, synthesis of oligonucleotides, their characterization, and a bit about their applications. And uh, during the same time, I learned so many instrumentation techniques, uh, including all the instruments related to oligonucleotides. Uh, one was uh, LCMS, mass spec. And with that uh, experience and skills, I got my next job in PPD, that is pharmaceutical product development as a senior scientist in LCMS area. I was there for about one and a half year. Uh, it was more of a routine uh, work uh, related to LCMS characterization and uh, uh, analysis of drug products and uh, drug uh, substances. And it was mostly related to the large molecules, including peptides, oligonucleotides, and uh, some, some sort of enzymes and all that. Uh, but because it was routine, I started searching for a little bit uh, innovative work, and I landed in Serenomics as a senior scientist again, but this time I landed into R&D 
And this is the area where I'm currently working. And I'm working on the development of oligonucleotides, especially the synthetic ones, shorter oligomers. And uh, I do take care of the entire oligonucleotide synthesis department here. And perhaps I'm the only one here. Many, many people help me on that one. And currently we are actively looking for some people to join uh, with me. And uh, uh, the oligonucleotides I'm synthesizing are pharmaceutically important ones. And we are basically working in uh, siRNAs area, that is short interfering RNAs. Uh, and uh, Serenomics is a startup company and uh, not, not very old. It, is, it, it, it established in about 2007-8, uh, uh, but in Pipeline, we do have several drugs and I'm fortunate to have an opportunity to work on all of them. Uh, hardly anybody in my company uh, is touching all the projects uh, except myself. And uh, proud to be the Michigan Tech alumni because uh, it was Michigan Tech uh, that introduced me to this area. And currently, uh, this siRNA or RNA interference is really, really booming. And uh, I'm looking forward to continue in the same area uh, as a uh, scientist uh, for at least another five to 10 years. And thereafter, I will decide whether to go on manager side or something like that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Pispa. Hey, so I'm Elisa Pispa. I'm originally from Finland. I'm a 2015 Michigan Tech alumni. I loved it there. I uh, did the PhD was in geology, but was more actually in geophysics, but it was because the geophysics didn't come as a degree until I think right after I graduated. Uh, then I did a postdoc uh, in New Zealand, and after the postdoc, then I went to uh, Ecuador for an assistant professor position in geophysics and uh, stayed there for four years. And now just last year, I moved to Iceland, and here I'm a, a kind of like an equivalent of an assistant research professor, and I have my own laboratory that I'm the head of here, so... And if I if I seem a little tired, please don't mind. It's it's eleven past eleven already, so I'll try to stay awake. Thank you for inviting me for this. Well, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we really appreciate those, especially those who are in different time zones right now, being here. Doctor Hop. Hey, it's me. I'm Chet Hop. Uh, originally from just outside of Ann Arbor. Uh, but I did my undergrad degree in geology in Bozeman, Montana, uh, and then came to tech as part of what used to be the Peace Corps Masters International program, uh, which sadly no longer exists. But I did my Peace Corps service in, in Panama. And during that time, I studied a, a volcano, kind of became a seismologist um, just through convenience. Um, so graduated with a master's in geophysics from GMES and then <laughs> followed Elisa actually to Victoria University in Wellington, uh, where I did my PhD uh, in collaboration with a, a geothermal power company, monitoring seismicity at a couple of their uh, power production fields on the North Island. And then uh, 2019 went to Berkeley, California, uh, which is, who currently employs me, I'm a postdoc, uh, working on mostly the same sort of thing, enhanced geothermal energy, um, specifically the, the seismicity associated with these types of projects at uh, Berkeley Lab. Um, shout out to Kelsey, I actually live in Santa Fe, so I can either see your house or shout at you right now, but uh, my partner works at, at Los Alamos National Lab, so that's my story. You're funny. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Basu. Uh, hi. Um, so my journey started back in India. 
uh, becoming a scientist. And uh, basically, I was interested in biology from my childhood. I had a special knack for it. Uh, that's when I decided that I would uh, go into a non-traditional way of you know, higher studies rather than doing engineering or medicine. So I uh, went on to do my bachelor's in zoology, but then I shifted my gears, did my master's in molecular biology and genetics. That was in Presidency University, India. From there, uh, I worked for two years in, um, in a CSIR. It's a Central Institute of Indian Government. And over there, I basically conducted a lot of researches and that took me into a special interest in viruses and cancer. From there, I decided I wanted to pursue my PhD in US. That's when I started, gave GRE and started applying, came to Michigan Tech. It was a complete change of weather, but uh, survived over there and it was fantastic. Those five years, um, I couldn't complain. Uh, but Michigan Tech gave me a lot of things, a lot of experience in terms of exposure, in terms of research, everything. Over there, I was fortunate enough to finish my PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology with a major focus on viruses and vaccines. And um, so being a virologist, I always waited for a pandemic. And uh, so it was interesting. My PhD was quite interesting. At that time, the Zika outbreak happened. And then so that's what my PhD research was on. And I finished my PhD in 2019. And I decided that, you know what, I wanted to do more applied research and wanted to actually get the vaccines out in the market. So that's when I shifted my gears and I decided I didn't want to do postdoc and uh, moved into industry position. And my first industry position was in Technovax. It was a collaboration with NIH and we were working with a lot of different universal flu vaccine and other different types of project, moving on to clinical trials. From there, um, the pandemic hit again, COVID-19 happened. And uh, unfortunately the company had to switch their whole strategy and everything. So I had to shift also to a different company. That's when I moved to a different position at Helena in New York itself. And I was promoted to a much higher position as a team lead over there. And I was a clinical immunologist, which means bringing a kind of a food product which has antiviral and immunologically benefit products available, immunity components building benefits basically. Worked over there and then got offered another, a very higher position, which is my current position right now. It's in humane genomics. I am the company's technological lead uh, and I'm leading the company in terms of designing viruses targeting against cancers. So that's where I am right now, enjoying the position so far, but um, my whole strategy and the whole career development has been focused on viruses. So if anybody is more intrigued about viruses, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Your work is super relevant. <laughs> we're we're yeah. uh, very aware of how important virology <laughs> is right at the moment. Thank Thanks. you so much. Dr. Sengupta. Hi, hello everyone. Thank you. It's an immense pleasure to be here again. Um, feels like with, I'm with my Michigan Tech family all over again. Um, so my name is Aparupa Sangupta and I'm originally from India. And I came to Michigan Tech um, in 2008, fall. So my journey is uh, similar to what uh, Rupsa um, was mentioning hers, that I started my master's there. And I was always interested in biology, primarily because my mother is a, a master's in zoology and she taught me biology with very much passion. So um, I got passionate very early on. So it was a no brainer that I chose biology. But um, then I got the opportunity to come to Michigan Tech um, initially to Dr. Shekhar Joshi's lab who's the chair of the uh, Department of Biological Sciences right now. And um, I did a master's with his lab. And then, um, so I actually have a master's in forest molecular genetics and biotechnology. So my forestry colleagues here. <laughs> and then I moved to about the Department of Biological Sciences where I did a PhD in microbiology and um, environmental biochemistry with Dr. Susan Bagley and Dr. Rupali Dutta. 
And so I would say, <laughs> I was hearing everybody's story. Some I knew, some I didn't, but uh, you'll see, I have a really non-traditional career here. So um, before I jump into my positions, I would say that I got really inspired working in Dr. Bagley's lab because um, she has been one of those professors, if you had the honor to work with her, who um, vehemently and very vocally encourages people to you know, seek non-traditional careers if that's what they're interested in. Um, and I got the opportunity to work with her and I, I always wanted to have a impact um, in like an applied fashion. And so I, I chose a career right after my PhD, I got a position offered at Michigan Tech. So as I was kind of trying to escape the winter, that never happened. So I got, <laughs> I got frozen uh, minus 30 degrees. Um, it was all good, but no, um, you know, jokes apart, it was great because that gave me the footing. Um, because even back in India, I used to think about, I used to think a lot about global policy risk reduction, but um, didn't really directly got, get the opportunity there. So I worked with the Department of Compliance, Integrity and Safety uh, with Joanne Polzin, who is now retired as their lab safety scientist and responsible conduct of a research instructor and the university coordinator. So that kind of set the um, you know, scene right over there, kind of got me into the niche of biosafety, biosecurity, but I had limited knowledge at that point. So then I was there until 2016. And then in 2016, um, Rutgers happened. So I moved to New Jersey to Rutgers. Uh, so you'll see I have kind of moved around the United States trying to look for my way where I really want to be. So um, then I was there as a biosafety officer. Um, and for people who don't know what biosafety, biosecurity is, is basically risk reduction and safety in the lab as you work with very important research that goes on. Um, and so from there, I got the opportunity. And I think that kind of set my career to where I am today. Um, in 2018, I was headhunted by University of California, Merced being their newest campus that they established. They were looking for someone who has wide experience in research, who would set up their um, labs or their program from scratch for biosafety, biosecurity. So I was their first biosafety officer. Then I became the manager. My team grew. And as things were going really great, and we were opening a high containment research labs with um, infectious disease research, 2019 December happened and then 2020 January happened and we all know what happened there. So pandemic happened. Um, and since I was there, microbiologist who was already uh, dealing with risk reduction, they put me on the, um, you know, their emergency operation command as the technical lead or technical expert for COVID operations. So that was quite an experience, um, but due to time constraint, I mean, I will keep it short. So I used to basically do all application of my knowledge, basically transfer the knowledge that I use in the lab and take it to the field and just, you know, and it was every day. So we have pulled in 14, 15, 18 hour shift. So almost sleeping in, in the office while that was happening. So then I got the promotion right after COVID and I became the assistant director of environmental health and safety. And then fast forward in 2021, um, as the high containment research labs were opening, uh, they made me the director of high containment research labs. Um, in the meantime, all these good things were happening. I had a personal loss in 2021 uh, where I lost my father to COVID in India all of a sudden. And so um, I was kind of, um, thinking about how the things happen and why the things happen and what could we have done better, we as a society, not just particular one country. Um, and also obviously I was dealing with my COVID, um, you know, the whole burden or the burnout that happened in 2020 and 2021. Um, with all of that, I thought I really wanna be in a place where I wanted to be probably, you know, I used to think about it as a young, you know, um, teenager or right after as I entered college in the global policy. And that's when I took all the experiences I had. And um, so this is my dream job. I landed my dream job in 2022. So I work for a major think tank now, and I'm placed in Washington, DC. 
um, literally um, eight minutes walk from the White House, which is a beautiful area. Um, and I work as the senior program officer and scientist for global biological policy and programs at NTI Bio. So NTI is Nuclear Threat Initiative, and they work with, um, they have a global policy and programs um, for different kinds of threats, nuclear threat, um, chemical threat, bio threat, and radiological threat. So they work on the threat reduction program, and they work with US government directly and different other governments and different um, you know, um, countries. And um, especially they are focusing right now on low um, you know, economy or a resource limited country to build up their global biological policy and programs so that the debate that is currently going on, whether the virus SARS-CoV-2 was uh, accidental release or whether it happened from a meat market, such kind of risk reduction can happen so that important research goes on by safe science is actually continued to be practiced. So that's what I do. So I work with different projects over there um, with different stakeholders from government to politicians. So it's a very diplomatic slash, it's a very thin kind of line of diplomacy and um, scientific um, you know, uh, leadership. So, and uh, it's definitely my dream job. I am hoping to make some really good impact there. So um, thank you for inviting me here and I'm happy to share more details. I'll speak about our intern internship program to the bio graduates here. So hopefully <laughs> I can take some of you guys with me <laughs> to my um, new position. And it's a very, very exciting job. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for all of your contribution towards stopping or helping with the pandemic. I know that multiple of you have spoken to that and it's it's very appreciated. And last but not least, Dr. Songer, please take it away. Hi, welcome. Uh, can you see me okay? Okay, good. I didn't know, I don't, I don't see myself. So anyway, um, well, I'm, I, I think I'm definitely the oldest one in the group. Um, and so most of my career is behind me. Um, you can see I started at Michigan, graduated at Michigan Tech in 1979 with a, a extra pre-med degree, or, but it was a bachelor's in biology. Um, met my wife there and she got a degree the same year in uh, uh, plant ecology. Um, then in 1983, I, I graduated from the University of Illinois, uh, doctorate in medicine, of course. And then uh, I went into an orthopedic residency program at University of Illinois. And uh, then I followed that up with uh, a spine fellowship at Northwestern University. Finally, uh, 1989, I uh, returned to the UP and I've been practicing in Marquette ever since then. I, uh, I've been a, primarily a spine surgeon, but I do general orthopedics as well. Uh, in 2012, um, I'm sorry, uh, actually, I think I put that wrong. I founded, I put that in the wrong date. I founded Pioneer in 1992. I don't know why I said 2012. Founded Pioneer Surgical Technology. Um, it was, uh, it's been a very interesting, so I'm, I'm, I'm a guy that likes to start things. I started that company. It was a medical device company, um, primarily developing, uh, inventions in the spine arena and uh, that was that was pretty successful it was sold actually it was sold around 2012 in 2012 that i then uh founded frontier medical technology that was after i exited um pioneer and uh, somehow in the in all that i got an mba at northwestern university in 2006 kind of went by that one and then uh, so, uh, and that has also um, been sold now. So I'm at the twilight of my career and uh, just in the middle of the pandemic, my wife and I founded a nonprofit called UP CityServe. So, so we know about successes and failures in starting a business. And so that's, <laughs> any questions on that? We have some great stories and some horror stories. Well, thank you, you've got a lot of expertise there in, in all of your experiences. Um, with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I have questions prepared, but also I want to open up the floor at this time for any questions that students or other participants may have at this time. 
So if you have a question, you can unmute yourself and ask or raise your hand. Otherwise, I've got some questions prepared as well. Okay, I will ask questions. <laughs> um, whoa. Uh, so to the entire panel, whoever wants to answer can answer. You don't all have to answer this question, but um, what led you cho to choose your specific degree as far as the end level and the program go? And how has getting this degree influenced your career thus far? Tone, I'll jump at once to answer. <laughs> well, I'll start off. I'll start off. Um, my mother saved a newspaper article when I was five. Somehow I got a stethoscope and somebody saw a cute kid and wrote a newspaper article about this kid that wanted to be a doctor. So ever since about the age of five, I wanted to be a doctor. So that, you know, that was just kind of the, the course that I took. And that was uh, uh, a medical doctor, that is. And, um, and I, I've never regretted it. I love taking care of people and helping people. Awesome. Well, I see a question in the chat. So Emily asks, for those of you working as research scientists, how much freedom do you have to build collaborations and partnerships with folks outside of your institution? Uh, should I answer a bit? Uh, yes. Okay, please. sure. So as far as collaborations are concerned, when you work in the industry, those are all regulated by uh, what, what, what's the purpose of collaboration. And it doesn't go through individualized process, but it goes through the mechanism that every uh, company might have their own mechanism. Uh, as far as my company is concerned, I can initiate the collaboration directly with any third party. Uh, that I think is beneficial for my work and it is uh, beneficial for the company in turn. So currently I started uh, uh, talks with my PhD supervisor, Dr. Fang, because I work in the oligon uh, oligonucleotide and uh, Dr. Fang has uh, very good hands as well as uh, very, very uh, good knowledge in, in the field of oligonucleotide and he has developed very, very novel uh, synthetic uh, methodology for oligonucleotide. And my company is looking to use that. Be my company means basically I initiated it and I'm convincing uh, my uh, supervisor, my management, and they are uh, theoretically agreed on uh, leading this uh, to next level. So most likely next week, I'm meeting uh, with Dr. Fang uh, to see what is his thought. So this is how uh, things happen when you work in kind of startups. It's not a very big company and you are kind of uh, leading your own area all the time. And uh, here it's easy to start the collaboration. I'm not sure about the big company, but I worked in big company previously uh, in PPD. That is one of the biggest uh, CRO uh, around this uh, US and globe. So. I did not see such uh, freedom in big company when you start your career. At least I think in the beginning years, uh, you probably cannot initiate this kind of stuff unless you are directly working under somebody who is very creative, very innovative. And that's the answer from my side. If anybody wants to add, they can add. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Halami. Would anyone like to add uh, their perspective from either academia or from a bigger company? Dr. Carter, I see you're unmuted. Yeah, I can just add um, kind of the view from the um, national lab side of things, which is probably closer to academia than industry there. We are very much encouraged um, to build collaborations with other um, scientists and anybody from other institutions. And it's really encouraged um, however, with a lot of government jobs, sometimes it ends up being difficult because my, like a, a scientist or a postdoc's overhead pay is a lot more than they actually make. So it actually costs a lot of money to 
kind of meld like academia through universities with national labs specifically. I don't know how that works with other government institutions. So it's really strongly encouraged to build outside collaborations, um, but there are also often a lot of obstacles associated with that on, you can work together, but, but kind of getting research projects together is um, a little bit more difficult than say like two university researchers like collaborating to submit a proposal because you often have to submit proposals to different institutions. So like at a national lab, you can't submit any kind of proposals to NSF. Um, you submit either internally through the national lab or you can submit through different DOE specific funding or other institutions depending on your field. Um, but yeah, encouraged, but a little bit more difficult um, with the national lab side of things. I'm, I'll add to what Kelsey's talking about. There's there are a couple of different types of national labs. There's nuclear security labs, which is Los Alamos, Sandia, uh, Livermore, and then there are DOE Office of Science labs, which is most of the rest. From our perspective at Berkeley, we are actually contractually obliged to partner with industry partners for certain funding sources. Um, just speaking from a geophysics perspective, we work with a lot of small startups on sensor, um, like new sensor technologies and things like that. So we kind of come in with DOE funding and they come in with new technologies. And that's sort of the, the model that DOE is, is trying to, to promote there. So in some cases it's, it's mandatory for funding depending on, on the stream at uh, the Department of Energy. Thank you all for your perspectives. That was very informative. Um, I have one more question. So I see a second question in the chat and we're actually going to go into department specific breakout rooms around 645. Oh, my question will be delayed. Go ahead, Kamal. Uh, thank you so much for organizing this, first of all. And so I have a question regarding the uh pressure people who wants to join any industry like uh how an international as an international student what kind of approach should be followed to join any industry or like should be should we be concerned regarding doing any internship or like what kind of approach should we follow for that i can take that question so I would say, yes, internship is definitely encouraged. Um, as an international student, uh, we all had the option of doing CPT. So if you want to take the opportunity of CPT, I did a CPT. Now, the industry I chose at the time, I worked for US Army Corps of Engineers in Vicksburg, Mississippi. Um, that's not the exact route I eventually went. But, but by exploring the options, you get to know. So I always think about it as in my career that um, your one experience to the next experience, you always build upon the last experience and then you want to do something more and then something more. And then, so all the avenues keep opening if you kind of keep exploring. So I did an internship, um, I did not go that route, but it definitely opened some more ideas which I wanted to explore and it kept happening that way. So yes, internships is a great idea. Also, um, I don't know what your major is, but um, for any major, I will always speak for bio. Um, right now, I mean, it was always like that to begin with, but even in last just decade, the opportunities are immense with the biotechnological advances and things like that. So even for other fields, I'm sure there is similar things. So keep an eye out and look for internship or opportunities. Um, a lot of internships are actually paid internship. Um, so if anybody is interested from biology department, uh, for the internship in bio, I can give you some of the leads and these are all paid internship. Um, so yeah, that is a really good thing to do as you're doing your PhD. Um, and one last point I'll say that there is a lot of, um, I would say kind of uh, hesitance in international students that whether or not I will be able to get in the industry or do I have to go the traditional route of doing postdocs and you know getting into the being a professor or any, anything else that you want to do. And um, that's not always true. You just 
uh, have to explore it in the right way. I understand with being international students, a lot of immigration limitations comes in, but even along with that, if you have the right experience or that you are in the exploring the right path um, with your CPT, et cetera, you will be able to, you should be able to, um, you know, get early on into the industrial path or uh, the non-traditional path. Thank you so much. That was a great talk. Uh, I'm in the chemistry major, so I hope in chemistry also. Is, I don't know because, like, right now I'm in the end of my PhD, so I don't know whether internship is possible, like during the last times or not. So I can add something to that because I was in a similar position like you, Kamal, and um, I can tell you exactly what I did. So uh, my advisor didn't allow an internship during my PhD. And that's because we were a very small lab and we were just like two PhD students at that time. And he wanted us to finish our PhD and then do whatever we wanna do. And uh, so internship is definitely recommended like Aparupa mentioned, and um, it's a great way of paving your path into the industry, but I didn't have that option. So what I did instead was after my PhD, directly applying for industry positions, which also had postdoc positions in them. It's a matter of uh, first doing a lot of networking. That's the main thing, what you need to do for getting into industry positions. I mean, cold applications you can do. Uh, you might do like 300 and then with internationals, with sponsorship, there are a lot of issues which come in handy along with that. So I would say that uh, first thing is networking, get to know someone in the company beforehand, talk to them and ask if that company is sponsoring them or who they should be talking to or who you should be talking to. What does the trajectory look like? Once you start speaking with a lot of people, then you would get an inside approach of how to apply or where to apply, whether that is a suitable position for you or not. Uh, that's what that's exactly what I did. And after reaching like a lot of people, 10, 20, 50, you start getting connections requests, and then you start building up your LinkedIn profile and things like that. Then you start getting recommendations or referrals inside for job postings. That's how you apply. Otherwise, you are you are just a pile of other applications which are going into the application portal and nobody's seeing it at the end of the day. So uh, I would say that if you can do internship, very good, go for it. If you cannot, don't lose hope. Um, apply for industry postdoc positions or go for startups, I would say. Uh, startups are much more open to hiring recent graduates in terms of PhD people, and they always need nice talent going forward. You can always jump from a startup to another startup or a bigger company, but then you need that necessary skill to build up your resume. That's what I would advise. Thanks. Okay. Oh, Kamal, do you have a follow-up question or? No, that's it. Thank you so much. Okay, awesome. With that, I'm going to go into breakout rooms. That felt a little like speed dating. It was very <laughs> fast, yes. but I hope everyone had good conversations. I know every time I popped into a room, it was very good conversation happening, so. We'll just wait for everybody to get back. I think pretty much everyone is back. So at this time, I again wanna thank all of our wonderful panelists for being here today. Um, we had some excellent conversation, some wonderful inputs. So thank you guys so, so much. Um, and at this time, you know, if you have contact information or you're looking to connect with current students here at Tech, please put that in the chat. Um, I will also take that information and try to What's the word? Spread it around is not 
the eloquent word I was looking for, but promulgate. What was that? Promulgate. Nope, that's not the word either, but it doesn't matter. Um, regardless, I will stay in contact with you and try to connect you with any students here who look at that. They're hiring. Um, who who might be perfect for the for for um, fitting in? Oh my goodness, it's late. <laughs> But yes, thank you all so, so much for being here. I really appreciate it. I'm going to hang out until everybody us. leaves. So <laughs> yes, thank thanks you. Thanks. Thanks, Margaret. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. Take care, much. guys. See you. Bye-bye.